announcement to make, and that is of a recognition that one of our family members has recently received. I just want you to know, and uh, if you haven't been looked at the website in the last uh, few days, uh, there is a recognition of the university called the University Faculty Scholar. So, uh, so that means university, for your university, faculty means a faculty member, scholar means this person is a scholar. Okay, so that's what it defines. And it's given to us in mid to be a faculty member who are sort of exceptional in some way. And uh, it comes not only with this honor, but in fact also for tangible $10,000 per year for support of research in any way the individual chooses. So it's really nice to have recognition plus some money which goes with it. A number of our former faculty, a number of our current faculty uh, who are with us have previously received the uh, University Faculty Scholar designation. And there are, in the college there are typically only three, maximum four per year out of total about 370 faculty. It's very rare sort of thing. But we've probably got the highest percentage, a very, very large, disproportionate percentage, which is always good to have, of the college faculty who are college and grants. And I'm just thinking at the fact at the risk of Missing some previous recipients, we have Professor Mike Harris, for the University Faculty Scholar. Uh, these last for five years, they've kept them 10,000 per year for five years, but we want to remain the people who have, of course. Uh, Harris, the very first batch were actually in Central Bank of the beginning. Uh, then we had Professor uh, Peck, <coughs> Harris, Gordon, Milo, Hillhaus, these are names that come to mind, and these, these are all. And now this year we have Professor David Corbett. has his B.S. Uh, from IIT Kanpur in 2000, and he came to Purdue from, from there uh, to become the, a founding member of the Discovery Informatics team. It was my pleasure, along with Jim Carruthers, to be his co-advisor on the research team. Uh, several things I want to point out about Aditya, uh, his career and my interaction with him. Uh, his first paper was a DFT paper, um, uh, and the idea was that he was going to do some serious modeling on a complicated reaction, uh, uh, aromatic, uh, or, or the formation of aromatics from propane uh, over uh, gallium wheels. And the idea was that we were going to use data from the literature. Well, some of you know that data from literature is a problem to start with, uh, but in this case, in fact, there was no data in the literature. So, so we had no data. So Aditya had not only to think about how to do this complicated modeling, develop these new ways of, of thinking about doing the, the parameter estimation, uh, but then he had to go to the lab and generate the data as well. And I realized that there was something unusual about this fellow. Uh, when I went into the lab, and very excited, he came up to me and said, oh, I know what's wrong with the chromatograph. And he took the, the gas sampling valve and pulled it apart and said, there, there's the descending order. And, and, and I knew that this was the person who could not only work with his head, he could also work with his hands. Um, characteristic of his way of doing things, uh, he wrote the literature survey that all of you uh, will write uh, to get your, your ticket out of here as part of your thesis. Uh, that was a very long chapter of his thesis, about 80 pages as I recall, uh, and it turned almost directly without a lot of variation into a review article in, in uh, uh, reviews uh, Review. Uh, so so uh, he, he has a way of extracting knowledge 
we went from here to Berkeley, to work here at UC in Jerusalem. Uh, and we did many things with the new space. We actually interacted with a number of the new space students and got involved in a lot of projects. But the one that I think is, is uh, the one that stands out is his discovery uh, as part of that team um, uh, of, of the very specific uh, polar source community of eight member things and geoites. And just going to tell us a little bit about that. One of the distinguishing characteristics of that work is that work actually got patented. More than that, he's getting royalties from that patent. So this is not just a patent of a patent. This is a patent that's a real thing. Generally. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, he tested the market uh, for academic positions in 2006 in Berkeley. And for reasons that are so mysterious to me, uh, it's far as the metal line. So he kept uh, on with Enrique another year of, of, of uh, catalytic uh, research maturation. He went out on the market in 2007, and he turned down a chair position for a, for a beginning faculty member. Maybe his chair position I can do for this person. He's done a very good job of getting started there. He has um, 11, 11 students in his group. His, his, uh, his developed some very nice close collaborations with Randy Schmidt and, and Michael Tupatka. Um, this excitement of his research is part of what draws the students. Uh, it's also brought in some recognition from the university in the ninth land grant professorship, which is a professorship given to uh, four people in the university at the time. Um, and he's also uh, won the, the three M. He's going to talk to us today about catalysis in a pocket, the catalytic consequences of spatial constraints and capture the seed. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I would like to start by congratulating the department on the centennial and wish it many years of success and continued in education and science and research. Um, it's great to be back here after six years. Um, it, it really has been a pleasure uh, meeting all the faculty, um, the hospitality, uh, Professor Ribeiro. I'm staying at his house, so it's been just terrific to, to be back here. Um, this also gave me a chance to reminisce, and this is the catalysis group at Purdue in 2004. Um, Victor's still here. There he is. Uh, um, so yeah, the, the, this was, uh, it was a really fun time to work here. Uh, particularly this opportunity to work with Professor Delgas, that was uh, an association that I'm very proud of and very, very grateful for. So it's been a tremendous um, experience here. And the alumni um, um, do care you know, a lot about this institution. It's re really doing some remarkable work. And uh, we wish you continued success. So um, congratulations to the department as a whole. With that, um, I'll start talking about my seminar. I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk to you about <coughs> zeolites. I'm going to, they're solid acids. These are the largest volume used industrial catalysts in the world. Okay. Most of the gasoline that you will see would have gone through one of these. Okay. I'm going to talk to you about a particular zeolite uh, for most of my talk. I'm going to talk to you about a zeolite called Mordnite. And these are crystalline aluminosilicates. So you take silicon oxygen, silicon oxygen. Every so often, you cheat and you put in aluminum, and you get solid acidity. These are solid acids. They have poor dimensions of 6.7 by 7.4 angstroms. But that's the large pocket. All the catalysis that I'm going to talk to you about today happens in this small channel. Zeolite shape selectivity is a phenomena that has largely been considered to be driven by size exclusion. Most people, when they think of shape-selective catalysis, if you've seen this in a textbook or you've heard about it, most people think of this as a size restriction phenomena or the transition state is too large for cavities to fit in. And I want to challenge this notion. I want to give you examples of the contrary and tell you this is a misinterpretation of shape selectivity. Shape selectivity does not arise because of size restriction. And I hope to show you, I was hoping to show you three, but in the interest of time, I might just show you two examples. All right? It's a, shape selectivity has been thought to be a size exclusion phenomenon. The other, the other notion, so I'm going to be a contrarian today, the other notion that I want to challenge is uh, when these um, high, high silica zeolites were, uh, were crystallized, uh, there was a lot of work done at Mobile. And the conclusion was that the rate per active site in zeolites is, for high silica zeolites is more or less constant. 
that is the other notion that I want to challenge. I want to show zeolites are not, is not a shape selectivity, is not a size restriction phenomena. And I want to show you that the rate per active site does depend on the location. They are not independent of where the active site is in these materials. All right. I'm going to show you this by example. I'm going to show you this uh, in context of three examples that I was planning to show you. But I think in the interest of time, I'll do two and try and do a better job with them. I'm going to start with an example. This is work that I did in my postdoc uh, at Berkeley on the carbonylation of uh, dimethyl ether. So I want to revisit shape selectivity in this context. All right. And I'm going to start with this example. And the idea here is the following. I want to take methanol or dimethyl ether add a CO and I make acetic acid. So if I add methanol and I insert carbon monoxide, I make acetic acid. Uh, BP and Kativa are two, uh, uh, are two companies that make this in very large quantities. This is currently done using homogeneous catalyst. This is uh, a very large homogeneous catalytic process using iridium or rhodium catalyst, using iodide co-catalyst. And the motivation for us was, can we go and do this heterogeneously? And we started off by, so you can do this heterogeneously. You can do this on a solid acid. So you take methanol and you add carbon monoxide, you make acetic acid. You can do this at temperatures about 350 degrees C. But at 350 degrees C on a zeolite, you get MTG chemistry, methanol to gasoline chemistry, and you start making a lot of other products. So you start making methanol to hydrocarbons. The selectivity is very poor, and you cannot make acetic acid in very high yields. The chemistry that I'm going to talk to you about instead is carbonylation of dimethyl ether. You can carbonylate dimethyl ether and make uh, methyl acetate. This chemistry happens at 150 degrees. Because I'm doing this chemistry 200 degrees lower in temperature, now I can do it very selectively. Instead of doing this at 350, I can do this at 150 degrees Celsius. And this chemistry, I, because I can do this at low temperatures, I can avoid MTG. And I can do this very selectively. And all of this is going to come down to, as I'll show you, the difference between methanol and dimethyl ether is that this is DME will not make water. All we're doing in this chemistry is we're managing water for kinetic purposes. Okay? And this is anhydrous carbonylation of DME to make methyl acetate. All right? So these are zeolite catalysts that are going to take um, DME, carbonylate, make CO. If you start looking at the effects of zeolite structure. So if we start testing this chemistry, this is low temperature chemistry. Uh, this is 165 degrees Celsius, very high pressures of CO, very low pressures of dimethyl ether. If you start looking at the effect of zeolite structure, we see that the rate on ferrierite, uh, as we keep increasing, is about 0.2. If we go to a larger pore material, we get a lower rate. If we go to modernite, this is the material that I said I'm going to talk to you about, you get a very high rate. And then if you go to still larger materials, the rate drops. So I'd like to understand, you see a hundredfold difference in, in rate. And what we'd really like to understand is why are these materials behaving so differently? So the kind of questions that we're trying to answer are the following. I'd like to understand what is the mechanism for this chemistry? How does this chemistry work on a step-by-step -step basis? I'd like to develop some understanding of this. What are we measuring when we're measuring a rate? Is there a particular slow step that drives this chemistry? And why is this the step, that slow step change when I go from zeolite to zeolite? Or why does the rate change so much? And the other, why do only some zeolites work? They have a hundredfold difference in rate. And we'd like to understand why some zeolites are much more active than others. All right? So if I start measuring, so for us, again, we, we try and investigate the kinetics mechanism and site requirements for these reactions. If we start measuring the rate as a function of CO pressure, we see that the rate increases with CO pressure up to 10 atmospheres. Okay? So the CO species must be very, very weakly held. It can go to very high pressures, and the rate is still first order. If you measure the rate as a function of DME pressure, this is the other co-reactant, it's zero order in DME. There's no effect. The surface must be already covered up by DME. I can keep adding more DME. It doesn't matter. The surface coverage doesn't change. All right, the surface must be, and this is again KPA, this is low pressure of DME, high pressure of CO. And this is the effect of, so the surface must be saturated with DME, and CO at very low coverages must be reacting with, uh, with this molecule, with whatever DME leaves behind on the surface. And the other interesting thing is, initially you get an induction period, you get an induction period, and then you get steady state rates. And then if you add water, as I said, water inhibits the rate a lot, the rate drops by a factor of 15 or so, and then if you take the water away, the rate comes back. 
So the kinetic effects of BME CO and water, water seems to reversibly inhibit the, the rate. I have to describe how water inhibits the rate. Um, CO is first order that is reacting um, with BME derived intermediates that cover up the surface because it is zero order in BME. So if BME derived intermediates are covering up the surface, what is the identity of these BME derived intermediates? That is the next question we want to ask. We can probe this spectroscopically. So if I take as I said these are crystalline aluminosilicates and they have Ronsted acid sites. I have a proton on there. If I add BME, what I see is that all these hydroxyl groups in the infrared spectrum, they disappear. Concurrently, we see the evolution of spectroscopic bands. These bands are assigned to surface methyl groups. So it appears spectroscopically, and this has also been seen by uh, DFT as well as NMR work, that you seem to make surface methyl groups. And these methyls are in fact persistent on the surface because for a methyl to leave to generate the catalytic site from CH3 to go to H, I have to make CH2. And there's no such species that I can make as a CH2. So this methyl is persistent on the surface. If this is indeed persistent on the surface, I should be able to count them. Okay? I make methyls on the surface. They can't desorb. I should be able to count them. And we can do this in a transient experiment. So the idea is the following. You take your catalyst. You add known quantities of dimethyl ether. And then you purge it. And then you see how much DME got retained on the surface of the catalyst. So you add known quantities of DME and you flush out the remaining with helium. And what you see is that all zeolites, irrespective of which zeolite I use, all of them make DME to aluminum with a stoichiometry of half. They make DME to aluminum with a stoichiometry of half because DME comes, it reacts with a Bronsted acid site, makes a methanol that reacts further, makes water. So DME to aluminum, you get. DME reacting with 2H plus to make a methyl. That stoichiometry is half. Okay? And concurrently, you see the evolution of water. And concurrently, in the mass spec, you see the evolution of water. So by infrared spectroscopy, by stoichiometric titration, we see the existence of surface methyls. And this is what DME is left behind on the surface. DME is zero order. And I said CO is first order. So what does the CO do when it comes in contact with uh, these intermediates? So if you bring CO, so yeah, the rate does not scale as a function of DME coverage. All, of, all the zeolites make, make methyls, and the rate does not scale with, these, uh, with, the, with the number of methyls on the surface. So what does CO do when you bring it in contact with surface methyls? All right, CO is first order. If you bring carbon monoxide in contact with, uh, with surface methyls, it does absolutely nothing. So we made DME on the surface. We bring methyls in contact with it, and they do absolutely nothing. So you, Next time you, you make surface, you, do, you purge it in CO, it does nothing. And the moment you bring DME back, you get a spike in your catalytic rate. So essentially, during the CO purge, I've accumulated precursors to methyl acetate that could not desorb. So you, during this purge time, CO reacts with these surface methyls to make acetyls. And these acetyls come off by reaction with DME. So all I've done during the CO reaction with the mass spec is all I've done is I've accumulated some precursors to methyl acetate that have accumulated on the surface. And um, these precursors are acetyls, as I, as I will show you. So what, what we see is that I get a spike in the methyl acetate rate the moment I bring DME or DME CO back. I can do this systematically. So I can take, uh, so this, ex, this methyl acetate that I formed represents the number of precursors to methyl acetate or acetyls that I've accumulated uh, during contact with CO. I can do this systematically. So I can do this, I can do this for 10 minutes in CO, half an hour in CO, one hour, four hours in CO. And I keep, an, I keep accumulating more and more acetyls on the surface. And I can bring them off in a spike and br bring off the excess methyl acetate. And that way, I can count how many precursors to methyl acetate can I accumulate on the surface of the catalyst. All right? So if I do this systematically, I get data that looks like this. Again, methyls get carbonylated to make surface acetyls. These acetyls react with, um, get methoxylated, make methyl acetate. That's my final product. And I leave behind the CH3, and that goes back on the catalyst. So this is the catalytic cycle that, that we seem to be running. So I get data that looks like this. I get a transient as, as a function of time that looks like this. There are two things that I want you to take away from here. The first one is I can carbonylate about 50% of the methyls. This is a number that I'd like you to keep in mind. This is a number I'm going to come back to later in my talk. Okay, about 50% of the methyls can get carbonylated. And the other thing is that I, from this data, I can get an initial rate. If I zoom in on the initial part of, the, of, uh, um, of this time sequence, I can get a rate. And I can compare that rate to my steady state rate. So if I zoom in on that part, 
I can get a rate from here, and that rate is very comparable to my steady state rate. Okay, that rate is only about half my steady state rate, which leads us to propose that indeed this step is the kinetically relevant step in this mechanism. So this the rate of carbonylation of methyls to form acetyls compares with the steady state rate of catalysis. It doesn't matter which zeolite we use. So that leads us to propose that CO reacts with surface methyls in kinetically relevant steps to form surface acetyls and then these get methoxylated to form methyl acetate and leave behind a surface methyl. So I started off um, so the, the catalytic cycle for this reaction looks like th this you take you form methyls on the surface using dimethyl ether that those methyls react with carbon monoxide to form surface acetyls and these acetyls can get methoxylated make methyl acetate and leave behind a surface methyl and you never form water. Water I showed you inhibits this catalytic sequence a lot. So, you never form water in this reaction sequence all right. I also showed you this uh, earlier you get an initial induction period and this induction period corresponds to initially I have a proton covered surface initially I have, I have to make the first methyls. So, if I pre methylate the surface this induction period should go away indeed if I pre methylate the surface this induction period does go away right. So, I started off by asking a set of questions I said how does this chemistry work this chemistry works because it keeps the surface anhydrous you never once you make this is the initiation sequence once you make the methyl then you keep going around in this sequence and you never have to come back and make a proton again. So, you take the methyls uh, you carbonylate them to make acetyls they get methoxylated and we make methyl acetate. What are we measuring when we are measuring a rate what we are measuring when we are measuring a rate is the rate of carbonylation of methyls to form surface acetyls that is the slow step the rate of that step corresponds to the catalytic rate. So, that is the slow step in this reaction sequence the interesting question is this is acid catalyzed chemistry the all these zeolites have acid sites why do only some zeolites work. So, why do only some zeolites work comes down to why do only some zeolites seem to do this step while other zeolites do not seem to do this step and I will take this opportunity to remind you that these these rates are different by a factor of two orders of magnitude. So, all of them have acid sites all of them are capable of doing this catalytic sequence why do zeolites differ in their ability to carbonylate <coughs> methyls. So, which led us to another question is are all the acid sites in these materials equivalent we started off with the material that gave us the highest rate we started off with modernite and we started off by asking the question are all acid sites equivalent in this material or not and that led us. <coughs> so, we said ok if all the acid sites are equivalent then I should be able to exchange some of them, but the rate per proton rate per remaining residual proton should still be the same and we tried this using a number of methods. So, uh, what I am expecting is if all acid sites are equivalent I will exchange 50 percent of them, but the rate per acid site will remain the same it does not if you do if you exchange metal centers the rate goes down if you do this by a variety of other methods um, variety of other materials variety of other methods we see that indeed the rate per proton changes and what this is telling us <coughs> is that all H plus sites even in the most active material are not equivalent for carbonylation and the rate of carbonylation of methyls um, depends on the local structure and geometry of the catalyst. What is the local structure and geometry of this catalyst that is the picture that I had for you up up front uh, the material with the pocket. So, modernite has two different kinds of acid sites it has acid sites in large 12 membering channels and it has acid sites in these small pockets and we can discern them quite clearly in an infrared spectrum you can deconvolute the hydroxyls in the um, OH band uh, using spectroscopy you can uh, spectro so IR spectroscopy you get spectra like this that you can deconvolute you can add a variety of probe molecules like hexane or or pyridine and again access sites probably uh, 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 accessible only in the large channels and titrate those sites and you can um, get the number of sites in 8 8 member ring channels and 12 member ring channels. So, we see that about 55 to 60 percent of the sites in this material are in the 8 member ring channels of modernite. We can if we start looking at some of the cation exchange samples that I showed you if we look at a sample as we add sodium to this material when we add sodium the sodium goes and back exchanges for some of the protons and we lose some of um, some of the acid sites in this material. What we see is that this band becomes a lot more symmetric 
it looks like the protons in the eight membrane channels have been selectively exchanged away. And as these proton sites get exchanged the rate drops by an order of magnitude. So, it looks like the sodium cations selectively remove the active protons and the active protons are in fact in the small eight membrane channels of modernite. We can do this systematically I can take samples where we start exchanging different amounts of sodium. So, I can get rate per proton in these various channels ok. As I exchange sodium I see that the rate per proton or so the rate per gram it scales with the number of sites per gram in the eight membering channels over an order of magnitude in concentration. What this is telling us is that all the work is happening in those smaller eight membering channels of modernite. This is not an example of shape selectivity by size exclusion ok. Uh, I showed you effects of a number of cations I can put cobalt on here if I put another cation yes cobalt falls right there ok. The rate does scale with eight membering channels. So, rate scales with eight does it scale with 12 membering channels there is no correlation in the rate with the number of protons in the 12 membering channels. So, this correlation in rate with the number of sites is telling us all the action seems to be happening in um, eight membering channels of modernite ok. Um, if we add a titrant like pyridine, pyridine I said is a base that is large enough that is only going to go in the large 12 membering channels. We see that the rate drops maybe 10 percent and if I take the pyridine away it goes away and all the sites in the 12 memberings are, are titrated and the rate is not changed by more than 10 percent right. So, the large the protons in the large 12 membering channels of modernite do not seem to be doing any of the work and there is a I showed you this earlier as well I said this is the number I want you to keep in mind as I carbonylate methyls to make surface acetyls um, we get a number that looks like I can carbonylate about 50 percent. I can carbonylate about 50 percent of methyls and this correlates very well with the number of hydroxyls that we have in the eight membering channels of modernite. So, the rate scales with the number of uh, channels in the eight membering channels um, the number of me methyls that we can carbonylate in transient experiment scales and titration with pyridine seems to have no effect on the rate all of them tell us that there is a clear parallel in the rates uh, between the number of sites in the eight membering channels and um, uh, there is a clear parallel between the rate and the number of protons in the eight membering channels. What are the implications of this? Um, I showed you this the why do some zeolites work this is the question we are trying to answer we do understand what the mechanism is why do some zeolites work the only other zeolite that seems to work is ferrierite and ferrierite has protons in eight membering channels. I can count these. So, I can I can do uh, again spectroscopic methods I can use infrared spectroscopy and I can count the number of protons in the eight membering channels of ferrierite and if I put this on here ferrierite falls right here. And all the other zeolites well all the other zeolites they are really at the origin because they do not have hydroxyls in eight membering channels all the other zeolites fall on, on the origin. So, all the effects of proton density all the effects of zeolite structure are nothing more than the number of hydroxyls in eight member ring channels in these different materials all right. Um, this is a very recent example from Mark Davis's group at Caltech um, they have made ferrierites this is uh, this class of materials uh, they have made them by different uh, using different templates etcetera. They count the number of protons in eight member ring channels using NMR uh, we have used infrared they use NMR this is their data and I am guilty of putting that line on there, but all of their data is consistent with our hypothesis that it does not matter whether you take ferrierite does not matter whether you take a different zeolite all rates in these materials the rate of carbonylation of uh, methyls to form acetyls scales with the number of protons in eight membering channels right. So, <coughs> I started off by asking ok how does this chemistry work this chemistry works by keeping the surface anhydrous it does not form water. What are we measuring when we are measuring a rate? We are measuring the rate of carbonylation of methyls to form surface acetyls. And why do only some zeolites work? Some zeolites work or zeolites work because they have protons in eight member ring channels, eight member ring smaller channels. This is not an example of shape selectivity where we have size exclusion, all right. Shape selectivity is not a size exclusion phenomena. The more interesting question why are eight membering channels selective for this reaction? 
Why, do, why are the small, large channels is always easy to explain. I can say large channels don't do this, you know, or, you know, the reactant or the transition state didn't fit here. But now I'm saying actually the smaller one seems to be doing all the work. Why would the smaller one be doing all the work? So our hypothesis is the following. What, so the interesting question, the next question we want to ask is what, what is responsible for smaller channels? Uh, what is responsible for this unique shape selectivity? And the explanation we have is the following. This is my reactant state, this is my transition state, and the two things I can do to change the rate is I can either destabilize, I can change the coverage of either of these two reactants, I can destabilize the reactants, or I can stabilize the transition state. Which one of them is it possible that's happening? I showed you earlier, it's not the coverage of methyls. All zeolites, irrespective of which zeolite I use, they form methyls in the same coverage. So it's not the coverage of methyl groups. It could be a coverage of CO. We can probe the coverage of carbon monoxide in, again, spectroscopic studies and find out that um, CO absorbed on proton form zeolites, not on methylated zeolites, is they're within a factor of two. I'm trying to explain a factor of 100. It's not the coverage of methyls, it's not the coverage of CO. And there are at least no spectroscopic differences in observed stability of these intermediates, at least none that we can see by either NMR or IR or DFT studies. If it's not the coverage or stability of this species, could it be that it's the stability of the transition state? If it's not the reactant state, did we stabilize the transition state? And our hypothesis is the following, why this may be possible. It may be possible because reactants and products in, in zeolite catalyzed reactions are more or less neutral. They are um, alkoxide intermediates, whereas the transition state is highly ionic. It's carbocation, it's positively charged. It's positively charged and these zeolite oxygens are negatively charged. So our hypothesis was that this is a case of electrostatic stabilization. I have a positively charged transition state that is stabilized to a much greater extent by having these small pockets instead of having these big 12 member ring channels. Of course, this is experimentally, this is not feasible for us to probe, but we came up with this idea. So we said, if this is indeed a case of electrostatic stabilization, let's take the contrary case. Let's take a reaction that has very little charge separation at the transition state. So the reaction we came up with this HD exchange, this is as symmetric a transition state and has as little charge separation as possible, okay? So this is the reaction that's known to have the least amount of charge separation. So let's do this reaction. Then we should see very little differences between eight and 12, and we should see very little differences between uh, different zeolites, contrary to what we saw for carbonylation reactions. So then we started looking at HD exchange of, um, in different zeolites. So we started looking at HD exchange, again, using infrared spectroscopy, and what we're expecting is that for, the, for HD exchange, there should be no difference between 12 and 8, and indeed, we can go ahead and do HD exchange in these zeolites as a function of, um, uh, and monitor the hydroxyl band in the infrared, and what we find is that the rate between 8 and 12, that earlier differed by a factor of 100, is now within a factor of 1 and a half, because this is a much more neutral transition state, we do not expect these electrostatic eff effects to play a very large role, and we see very little effect as a function of uh, hydroxyls in eight member rings and 12 member rings, and we also see almost no difference between different zeolites. They're within a factor of two, whereas carbonylation rates are within a factor of 100. So neutral transition states are not perturbed very much by zeolite structure. Carbocationic zeolite transition states are perturbed, to, so location matters sensitively for very highly charged transition states. The highly charged transition states are stabilized much more in smaller channels than in larger channels. Um, I'll summarize this part of my work. I started off by saying that, uh, uh, <coughs> by telling you about carbonylation mechanisms. Carbonylation occurs in, um, in zeolitic acids by forming surface methyl groups that are carbonylated to make acetyls, that are methoxylated to make um, methyl acetate, and DME is much more, is superior to methanol because it never makes water, and water inhibits uh, this reaction. Carbon-carbon um, bond formation, this first CC bond formation, this is the kinetically relevant step in this chemistry, occurs only in the small eight membering channels um, of zeolites. This is not an example of shape selectivity by size exclusion. And finally, um, 
this may represent an example of transition state selectivity where ionic transition states are stabilized much more in smaller channels than they are in uh, larger 12 membering channels um, of zeolites. So, this is one example the second example that I will talk to you about is a reaction or also acid catalyzed also in zeolites also in a similar structure, but this is a reaction of commercial interest to, to take linear hydrocarbons and make branched hydrocarbons. Every time you take a linear hydrocarbon and you add a branch you add an octane rating of about plus 20. So, we are interested in taking uh, molecules like n hexane etcetera and trying to n hexane and heptane etcetera for gasoline range molecules to try and add a branch or two branches to make 2 methyl hexane or 2 methyl pentane because these molecules give us an octane rating of about plus 20. This is a reaction that happens on a bifunctional catalyst it is a catalyst that is a physical mixture of platinum on alumina and a zeolite and I am going to talk to you more about the zeolite chemistry. It happens as follows I feed it I feed my catalyst hexane and hydrogen. I feed it hexane and hydrogen the platinum this is two catalytic functions a platinum that does the hydrogenation dehydrogenation this is the metal and a solid acid this is the zeolite part and we will talk about the zeolite part. What the metal does is the metal takes the um, the metal dehydrogenates the the alkane to make the alkene uh, the alkene migrates to the acid site it absorbs on the acid site um, and it isomerizes to make the next branch to make a branched hydrocarbon um, alkoxide and the branching happens because I go from a secondary carbocation to a more branched carbocation. So, carbocation stability governs uh, the branching and this molecule sorry this molecule can then desorb from the acid side to make an olefin and this olefin can get hydrogenated to make the alkane. So, the metal all the metal does is hydrogenates dehydrogenates um, makes an olefin and then that olefin can get isomerized on the acid side and go form um, an olefin again a branched olefin that gets hydrogenated to make the alkane. Um, the rate limiting step I have written this as rate limiting step here there could be several rate limiting steps we know the metal is not rate limiting because we can keep adding more and more platinum per acid site if we change the platinum to acid site ratio nothing changes no rates no selectivities no nothing the metal is equilibrated the metal function is equilibrated and what the metal does is equilibrate between the alkane and the alkene we feed alkane and we feed hydrogen. So, hexane goes to hexene plus hydrogen I am feeding two of them and the hexene concentration is fixed. So, the metal function does not do anything um, the desorption step could be rate limiting. Uh, we can probe that we add a molecule like deuterium D 2 O D 2 O will exchange with this OH site and make O D. So, now I have O D sitting on the catalytic surface and hexene will absorb and desorb and exchange many many deuteriums in the time scale that it forms. it does a catalytic turnover that means it is absorbing and desorbing many many times. So, it exchanges many many deuteriums in the time scale of a catalytic turnover and we can find out that diffusion is not rate limiting in these systems because I can make different crystallite sizes of these catalyst and run the rate and the rate does not change ok. So, if it was transport restrictions then I expect that if as I change the crystallite size of my catalyst the rate would change it does not right. If this mechanism is indeed correct and there is a lot of evidence for this I can postulate a rate equation like this. The rate equation the interesting part about the rate equation is the following it depends on hexane to hydrogen ratio hexane to hydrogen ratio those are my two reactants and those two reactants essentially control the concentration of the hexene because they are in equilibrium hexane hexene and hydrogen are in equilibrium. So, the only ratio that matters is how much hexane to hydrogen did I feed because that defines the concentration of hexene and hexene is involved in the rate limiting step. So, if that is the mechanism I get a rate equation that looks like this if I get a rate equation that looks like this I can linearize it all I have done is I have taken a reciprocal of the rate and I have written it as such. So, rate per prota if this is true then I should be able to plot 1 over r versus the ratio of hydrogen to n, n hexane I should get a straight line ok ok this is what we get for ferrite and this is one zeolite my prediction was I should be able to plot 1 over r versus this ratio I should get a straight line and from here we can get rate and equilibrium constant I can use these rate and equilibrium constants to then go see what my data is doing I can take those rate and equilibrium constants put them back into my data ok and this is the prediction we get this is one particular zeolite 
next one is mod night and the third one is beta. So all zeolites that we measure are described by this rate equation. Now that I know that I'm measuring the same rate across all these zeolites, now I have a chance to compare them. Until I know what I'm measuring as a rate, I could be measuring different rate limiting steps. There's no point in doing this. Now that I have a mechanism and have an idea what the rate constants, I can interpret them. Now I have a chance to go <coughs> and use this information. I can take this information and since they all follow the same rate equation, I can compare them. I can compare them and get an idea of how the rate varies. I can do the same trick that I told you earlier. I can take modernite. This is the one that has the pocket. This has the 12 membering channels and these little, little eight membering pockets and I can exchange the sodium and again as I keep exchanging sodium the red band disappears and only the sites in the 12 membering channels are left. Okay? And I can take this material. This material ha only has hydroxyls in the 12 membering channels and I can go see if this material will follow my rate equation. Indeed it does. So I can go take a, site, a material that has um, only 12 member uh, hydroxyls in 12 memberings and it also follows my, uh, my rate equation and follows the same trend that I would seen earlier. So given that all these zeolites follow the same rate equation then I can start comparing them. If I look at the rate, this is rate or uh, rate constant well in this case normalized per proton and I look at materials that have only sites in the 12 membering channels they have a flat rate. So all the 12 membering channels, all the sites in the 12 membering channels seem to do the same work. Now if I, if I bring the protons back in the 12, in the 8 membering channels the rate actually goes up. What this is telling me is that these little pockets, these are as I said four angstroms, they seem to be doing reactions of hexane. Hexane is about a nanometer long and this is very surprising to us. So not only does the rate go up, uh, um, so the rate, this is also telling us that as I am introducing protons back in here, the rate in 8 membering channels is actually higher than the rate in the 12 membering channels. So I can compute the rate in, uh, I already know what the rate is in the 12 membering channels. On the basis of this data I can back calculate what the rate is in the smaller 8 membering channels and I can get a graph that looks like this. So again 12 membering channels have a rate of 0.9, 8 membering channels have a rate of about 5. So the rate in the smaller 8 membering channels is about 5 times higher than in the smaller, uh, in the, than in the larger 12 membering channels. And again this is an example where uh, as I will discuss this further, um, size exclusion is not responsible for this higher rate. Why do I get higher rate in a smaller channel? Okay. Um, I have four zeolites and I, I, I have an idea of where the acid sites are located. I can calculate the rate in each one of them and we would again like to understand. I, I have an idea, they all follow the same mechanism uh, and I would like to answer okay, what is driving the rate? Is it entropy or enthalpy and why are some zeolites more active than others? So I can take this information and start asking this exact same question that I just mentioned. Is it energy or entropy that seems to drive um, the rate in these materials? And uh, for us it comes down to measuring kinetic parameters. I can, um, I can do um, Arrhenius type behavior and now that I have a rate equation that describes this, I can interpret uh, this Arrhenius type behavior in terms of uh, intrinsic activation energies and enthalpies. So if I go ahead and measure the um, activation energy in these materials, the first thing I note is that uh, ferrurite, this is the small membered ring zeolite, it has the lowest activation energy. It has the lowest activation energy and it has the lowest activation energy I will give you the, at least two reasons that are plausible and I will come back to these reasons um, as I go along. One is um, a lot of absorption in zeolites is determined by the pore size. So if I put a molecule, these are again 5, 6 angstrom pores. If I put a hydrocarbon molecule in there, most of the interaction here is by van der Waals forces. So the closer I am to the walls, the stronger the absorption. And what I measure as the apparent activation energy is intrinsic activation energy minus the heat of absorption. So that could be a reason that I have a stronger heat of absorption, hence I measure a lower E app, apparent activation. This is all we get to see in the experiment. And the other one, as I mentioned, this is a positively charged transition state that could be stabilized by uh, framework oxygens. And I will come back to this point again as well. This is one possible reason. Ferrurite has the lowest activation energy and the lowest rate. 
So, why would a reaction that has the lowest activation energy also have the lowest rate uh, the only possible explanation for it is that it must be having a very low pre exponential factor it has the lowest activation energy and indeed ferrierite is the zeolite that loses the most amount of entropy. So, we can de deconvolute the apparent entropy as well from these rate measurement and ferrierite seems to this is the smallest pore zeolite it seems to lose the most amount of entropy um, in this case. The more interesting case and I want to keep coming back to this is why do I put the 8 member ring zeolite as why does the 8 member ring zeolite behave like a large pore zeolite. So, uh, let us look at these what I call large pore zeolites why does the small little pocket in modernite behave like a large member large pore zeolite why does it behave like a 12 member ring zeolite here or a 12 member ring zeolite here. Um, the entropy loss is very similar in these materials which was surprising to us entropies are very similar yet the rates are not the rates vary by an order of magnitude. So, the only other explanation for us is that it must be the activation energy it does appear that the activation energy in these materials changes or decreases and in fact, it is lower in this larger pore material or in this smaller pore material than in this larger pore material and I will talk about that as well before I finish up. So, um, in larger pore materials it appears that energy is a driver for a driving force and not <coughs> entropy as it was for ferry right all right. I want to come back to this particular material I have been talking I want to talk about catalysis in a pocket why does this pocket seem to behave so differently than um, why do hydroxyl groups in the small 8 membering channel behave so differently um, than they should what we are expecting is that this small channel should be inaccessible to mo large molecules like hexane, but it is not it has comparable entropy loss and it has a lower activation energy. The lower activation energy is actually the simpler part to understand what we measure is an apparent activation energy in this material what we measure is this E app this E app um, can be lower for two reasons I, I showed you one of them is because I have a positively charged transition state and it is stabilized by these negatively charged oxygens and that is one possible explanation why the activation energy may be lower in this smaller channel than in this larger channel. The other explanation is the following um, the heat of absorption in 12 membering channels this is work from the literature um, is here and really for 8 membering channels it should be somewhere here. So, this heat of absorption is lower and hence what we measure as the apparent activation energy that might be lower that was not the surprising part to us the surprising part to us was why are these two numbers so comparable these two numbers should not be so comparable for the following reason every time you absorb stronger every time you absorb stronger you lose more entropy this is entropy of absorption this is a negative number this is a, a, a enthalpy of absorption this makes sense the stronger you absorb the less freedom you have on the surface ok. So, this is what we were expecting. So, if this material does absorb stronger why is the entropy so comparable in these materials and our hypothesis is the following we think this is an example of partial confinement it is an example of partial confinement where the molecule is so big that it can only sit in the cavity partially most people would call this poor mouth catalysis that is a phenomenological interpretation of this data this is entropy driven reactions where the molecule is so large that it can only sit partially in a cavity it has a lot more freedom outside which we think results in an entropy loss which is lower than what you would expect if it was fully confined. So, we think it gets some benefit because of stabilization and hence the activation energy is lower, but it does not lose as much entropy as it should have because it is only partially confined and these benefits have been attributed to poor mouth catalysis in, in the zeolite literature. All the evidence that we have suggests that indeed we have uh, partial confinement because these 8 membering hydroxyls these OH groups in 8 membering channels of modernite do not behave anything like those in ferriorite. So, I will illustrate this by comparison. So, the 8 membering the hydroxyls in 8 membering of ferriorite uh, in here and 8 membering channels of modernite do not behave anything like each other uh, this one loses much more entropy this one loses much lower uh, does not lose as much entropy and we think again that is because of partial confinement and that one actually has a lower activation energy um, again consistent with this idea that this molecule is only partially confined in the small 8 membering pockets of modernite. Um, the other 
the other um, set of data that also suggests uh, the same thing is the following hexane can isomerize to make two isomers 2 methyl pentane and 3 methyl pentane and ferrite has a selectivity that is very distinct from any of the other zeolites and we can again deconstruct this we can deconstruct this into rate uh, we can deconstruct this into uh, entropic and enthalpic drivers um, in the in the various zeolites for ferrite this is the 8 member this is the actual small 8 member ring zeolite 8 and 10 uh, there is no entropic driver for this, but there is an energy penalty. So, it looks like small member small pore zeolites like ferrite put a constraint on the formation of 3 methyl pentane. Whereas, if we look at comparable numbers for this modernite sample, we see no distinction here. So, it does not like like uh, ferrite will put a constraint on the formation of of 3 methyl pentane this small 8 member uh, channels or pockets in modernite will not put this constraint right. It behaves distinctly from 8 membering channels um, known to exist in ferrite. It behaves like a large 12 membering zeolite again consistent with this partial confinement hypothesis uh, where we think that the active site is such that it only allows a part of the molecule to get in and um, this has been phenomenologically described as I said by poor mouth catalysis people would call this poor mouth catalysis. So, I will try and summarize uh, my work here uh, for hexane, um, hexane isomerization is a commercially important reaction uh, we can deconstruct the mechanism for this reaction to show that indeed the rate limiting step involves isomerization of uh, hexene to form 2 methyl pentene or 3 methyl pentene on the acid sites. Um, the rate is lowest in ferrite once we know that all these zeolites are working by the same mechanism because it loses a lot more entropy and um, these small 8 membering pockets in modernite seem to behave like large larger zeolites in all their catalytic behavior and we think this is an indication of partial confinement in these channels which have been uh, phenomenologically interpreted as poor mouth catalysis. So, I started off uh, my talk by saying that uh, classical shape selectivity has been interpreted as a size exclusion phenomena. Uh, most people think that it is because a reactant or transition state will not fit in there um, and yeah things are too large. Um, this is not true I have shown you two examples here one for um, um, carbonylation of methyls to form surface acetyls that selectively happens in 8 member ring channels of ferrite and modernite and it happens we think because positively charged transition states are much more sensitive to where the oxygen is located in these materials. So, it can happen site specifically in smaller channels this was one example and the other example um, was a discussion of the isomerization of N hexane where we think partial confinement drives reactions that are entropically favorable um, in these small member pockets of uh, modernite. Um, I would be remiss if I did not thank uh, my group and uh, a lot of the work uh, in this has been done by Shu Chong whose other example in uh, 8 membering channels I did not get a chance to talk to you about with restrictions on time. Um, I will leave you with uh, this schematic to show that we need to revisit shape selectivity it has been misinterpreted I think as a phenomena primarily concerned with size exclusion. It is a phenomena that involves a lot more dependence on local structure of the zeolite and we need to start considering effects like entropy dr entropic drivers, partial confinement, electronic charge on the transition state and we need to revisit uh, shape selectivity. Um, I would like to thank you for your attention and I will try my best to answer any questions you have. Basically, what platinum 
coverage mean you start to see this maximization? So pretty much platinum to H plus of 0.15 or higher. If you put any more platinum than you know one sixth of the asset sites, yeah, the platinum stops having an effect. The activation energy, yes, I did. I don't have it with me, but we did measure the, the activation energy in, um, in, the, in modernite using, using some of the materials that I talked about. In modernite, as you go, again, because the rate doesn't change as you change anything in the 12 membrane channels, the activation energy doesn't change either when we go vary samples uh, with different amounts of sodium. It makes it with greater selectivity than, than um, yeah. It makes it with greater selectivity than any of the other than the any of the other three zeolites. It makes it two and a half to one. Thermodynamically, or yeah. so thermodynamically, they're very close in energy. Close. Yeah, they're very close in energy. The three methyl pentane has a slightly has slightly more restrictions because it has a methyl branch hanging on it. That's what restricts the that's what restricts the formation of the three methyl pentane. Right. Okay, there's no marker here. Uh, oh, there is a marker here. So you, if you get a if you get a if you get something that does this and has a branch versus something that does this and has a branch, then yeah, because I have a methyl on here, it puts slightly more restrictions. So it makes the three methyl pentane with slightly lower selectivity because yeah, I have a slightly, I have more arms and legs. Right. And this is all trying to fit in again five angstrom pores. Thermodynamically, the driving forces are about the same. Okay. So it is a kinetic restriction. So um, the initial, not, not the initial rate, the, the, let me see if I can get this. Um, did I do something? I've got to try and go back to that slide. Um, um, I'm going to get back here. Um, So this is it. So the the we're trying to what we're trying to do is I put methyls on the surface initially, I carbonylate them, and those these acetyls are persistent on the surface. It cannot desorb. So for it to desorb, it has to leave as COCH2, as a carbene, which is not stable at these temperatures. It sticks around on the surface. So it's accumulating on the surface in these different CO. As I keep adding more and more CO, I keep accumulating more and more acetyls. And I can get an idea of how many CO acetyls I've accumulated in one hour, half an hour, and I can get data like this as a function of the number of acetyls. And I can compare this initial rate or this rate to the steady state rate that I get at catalytic conditions. This rate could have been orders of magnitude faster, could have been orders, 
it could have been very very different because if this is not the rate limiting step it could have been much much faster than the steady state rate because this rate is within a factor of 2 why is it within a factor of 2 and why is it not exactly that we don't know did we miss something here was this slope initially even faster and then it started curving over because the rate is essentially the, the rate constant times the coverage of those methyls times the CO and that coverage of methyls is essentially 1 because the surface is entirely covered by these methyls and we're trying to so you know could two methyls are there two acetyls that interact during steady state catalysis this is a transient I only uh, the moment I make the acetyl I've perturbed it during steady state you know the, are there any interaction between these methyls that we get slightly differently that might explain a factor of two but this rate could have been an, you know 10 times 100 times 1000 times faster than the steady state rate and I would not have been able to discover you know that, that this rate would have been very comparable to the steady state rate Can you this is like kiloseconds, or? kiloseconds. So this is very large time this rate reaction is very slow it's not an so it this surface is predominantly covered by methyls and we're exposing it to CO for 15 minutes 30 minutes one hour and we're trying to get a rate or two hours I guess in this case and trying to get how many acetyls accumulated on the surface of the catalyst I think I'm going to exercise my Sitting across the desk from this fellow for four years, watching him discover and develop this skill. It's the reason I took this degree of learning, so I can use it for these for two years. And with that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to thank the teacher for uh, a beautiful demonstration of the importance of kinetics, a detailed chemical understanding of the catalytic kinetic. Thank you.